We're coming into October now, and as many of you know, October 31st is, of course, what? Thank you. Shame on anyone who said Halloween. No, just kidding. Uh, but Reformation Day, the anniversary of when uh, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the Wittenberg church door um, and launched um, what is called the Protestant Reformation. Well, what is that? That's what we're going to be diving into today. There, I, we could and hopefully eventually will do a full series of classes uh, on this topic so this will be the flyover 30,000 feet, the, hi the history of the Reformation in 45 minutes or less. Uh, so there, I'm sorry that I probably won't get to some of your favorite guys, some of your favorite events, favorite writings that happened. This is going to be a really quick overview. But as we come into a time of celebrating and remembering the Protestant Reformation, that important time in our history and the, the, the roots of our faith and where we are right now. Um, that important place in between the time of the New Testament that we all read about so much and our time right now where our church sits in recognizing that that's not just a worthless, empty vacuum in between. And this is a very, very important season in church history. It's very valuable for us to know about. So uh, the hardest part actually about this is how to begin. Um, because this is where it would be nice to have a whole extra lecture or two or six just to go into the medieval world, what it was like. That it's, a play, it's, a, it's an environment in many ways so alien to where we are right now and so alien to what we read in the pages of the New Testament that it can be hard to put ourselves there to grasp the significance of the rest of the events. We start reading or hearing about Inquisitions and crusades, cardinals and popes and anti-popes and relics, the veneration of saints and images, and all of it is so alien to our own worship and completely alien to anything we find in, say, the book of Acts. And we're like, well, how did that even happen? Unfortunately, I can't draw all the historical lines today. But it's important to recognize that over... 1,500 years from the time of the New Testament, human traditions developed in different places at different times, and our focus here is what was going on primarily in Western Europe. Immediately after the New Testament, the gospel started exploding in all directions. We often, when we think about church history, only think about what was going on in the borders of the Roman Empire. There's a lot of focus on the church councils that happen there, the east and west side of the Roman Empire, um, and th there's, a very, uh, there's a very narrow focus often, and there's, there's good reason for that. There's a lot of really important things that happen there, but it's important to realize that the gospel went almost immediately beyond the borders of Rome, stretching out, to, stretching out east all the way to India, perhaps as early as the second century A.D., um, by 500 AD, we've unearthed Christian documents in as far east as China, people who, who would have had absolutely no connection whatsoever to the Bishop of Rome. Um, the, in Africa, you have the, the kingdom of Ethiopia, you have all, all sorts of places that are not in any way politically or organizationally connected to anything that's going on when we talk about medieval Western Europe. So we have to understand that church history is much, much bigger than what we're looking at here. But the, and the particular errors that happened there did not necessarily in every case happen everywhere else. So sometimes we look at how bad things got in one area of the globe in church history and think, man, was the gospel lost entirely? And we have to remember that Christ had his people everywhere, both within Western Europe and the Roman Catholic Church and far outside of it, in nations, tribes, and tongues all over the place. But where the Reformation happened is specifically in Western Europe, where by this time, after the fall of the Roman Empire, Western Europe became fractionalized into a bunch of different nations and kingdoms. And what held them all together in a sort of loose alliance, wars still happen, conflicts still happen frequently, but in a sort of loose alliance with each other, one common authority that held them together was 
the church as an organization, an organizational structure. And the head of that Western church in Western Europe by that time was the Bishop of Rome, who came to who we would say today the Pope. And the papacy developed a very, very strong, not only religious, but political um, strength and power in Western Europe over the course of the Middle Ages. And so by the time we reach the period of the Reformation, you have most of Italy actually isn't governed by a secular government. It's what it's called the pap- it's part of what's called the papal states. That he the Pope is not only a religious leader, but is the political leader of that region. He also exercises a great deal of authority over kings and lords in other places, um, using his ecle- ecclesiastical authority to, to influence their politics. And so he is a he is a powerful political leader. He, or sometimes uh, I have to say they, but we'll get there in a minute. <laughs> um, so over the course of this time, all sorts of other doctrinal issues, problems, difficulties were developing within that structure. So you had, uh, for example, the idea of purgatory, that a person would die in a state not of perfect grace, but also not in uh, being guilty of a mortal sin, a specific list of sins that even after you had come to Christ would send you back to hell if you did not uh, accomplish penance for them before. And so you were in this kind of middle ground, and that's where the majority of humanity fell. If you weren't good enough, you went to purgatory where you needed to be purged of that sin, either through your own suffering there over... Um, a lengthy period of time to suffer for the consequences of all those venial sins until finally you could be released into eternity, or having additional grace provided for you by means of that the living could do within the church. This may sound kind, this, this is where we may have a contact point here in Utah to that medieval world, because here there is a strong ecclesiastical structure, a strong religious system in which if someone can die in a state where they're not going to be cast into outer darkness, but they cannot yet attain celestial glory. And so someone else has to go into a temple and do works on their behalf that they can then receive in the afterlife. And so this uh, this general idea, there's there's a ton of differences between purgatory and the Mormon system of spirit prison, but there's enough of a parallel that it can give you some grasp of how this kind of idea can, false uh, idea can develop and the kind of stranglehold it can gain to lock people in to running this treadmill their whole life of trying to be good enough, and not only trying to be good enough for themselves, but trying to do enough for their loved ones. Give enough, do enough, help enough, uh, be righteous enough, accomplish enough to, get, to, to avoid purgatory themselves and to get their loved ones out of it. And this is the situation that Europe was in. This false gospel, due to a, a human tradition that had developed creating a hierarchical church structure, putting a man on top whom the New Testament church would have been, it just would have been completely alien and unknown to them. This structure had produced a situation where corruption could flourish. And it did. Even faithful Roman Catholics who would have no sympathy to the Reformation recognized issues that were going on that needed to be dealt with. You had, for example, absenteeism. People who would get appointed to be a bishop over a local uh, church and then never actually go there, just get the income and go do their own thing. They, uh, and so they would be appointed to be the bishop of this church, but would never actually serve the church. It was just a source of income, and someone else would have to actually take care of that flock. Even the Roman Catholics realized this shouldn't be happening. But when you've so intertwined the medieval political structure with the church, it's rife for things like this. You had pluralism. Well, why only have the income of one church you're never going to show up at when you can have the income of lots of churches you're never going to show up at? So people would get appointed to be the bishop of multiple places at the same time. 
where it's now, it's literally impossible for you to ever be there because you can only be in one place at a time. And so then they would have all these incomes coming in from multiple churches. There was simony, which is a term used for the buying and selling of ecclesiastical posts. So if, if this ecclesiastical post, this, this, this bishop position is just a source of income, why don't I, I can sell that to someone who wants mine. We can, we can pass it around. It becomes a commodity. And of course, nepotism, a term we would still use today for appointing relatives rather than qualified people or, or people close to you who you simply want to give benefits to, appointing them to posts that they have no right or qualification to serve in. Not to mention, the Roman Catholic Church officially taught celibacy of all of the, for all clergy, which is itself an unbiblical teaching, but it also led to a kind of a problem when all of these priests had lots of kids but weren't married. Um, and again, these are things that official doctrine, even of the Roman Catholic Church, said were wrong, but they were happening. So everyone recognized there was a need for reform. But what most people saw reform as is let's bring everything back in line with the medieval Roman Catholic ideal. There are picture of what the church is supposed to be. And so there were many reform movements throughout the Middle Ages that tried to accomplish that. But they always very swiftly failed. The stories of which we don't have time to go into, but at the bottom line, they weren't dealing with the heart of the issue that a false gospel and a false church system could never ultimately result in virtue and holiness. They were trying to get the fruit of salvation without getting to the root of the gospel. And so, as we arrive at the Reformation, this is the issue that was primarily at stake to be dealt with. What is the gospel and a very close second, by what authority can we answer that question? What is the gospel, and by what authority can we say what the true gospel is? And so, this is what the, Re the, the Protestant Reformation, unlike all the reforming movements before, had the courage to ask this question and to bring the answer that transformed the world. But even before we jump right in there, there is one more thing that needs to be addressed. A common argument will be, well, the Reformation, it must not have really been able to answer that second question, by what authority? Because didn't the Reformation come in and shatter Christianity? Wasn't Christianity united before and then the Reformation came and now you guys have all these denominations? Didn't the Reformation come in and ruin everything because it got rid of the real authority? Don't we need a pope, or here in Utah we might say a prophet? Don't we need that authority that can tell us what the real interpretation is? Well, as a matter of fact, that isn't historically accurate. Um, not only is it untrue, but it's not, it doesn't even reflect the history of what happened in the Reformation. Very briefly, it's worth noting that Medieval Europe, even if we're just talking within where the papacy reigned, was already a house divided that could not stand. It was fractured. Throughout much of the Middle Ages, there were at least two and sometimes three rival popes who both claimed to be the true one, launching wars against one another, anathematizing one another, condemning one another and all their followers to hell calling for crusades against one another. Oh, you thought those were only against the Muslims? Oh no, rival popes called for crusades against each other. Um, on top of that, you had various other groups that existed within Western Europe that were not Roman Catholic. One of those reform movements that tried to turn the heart of the church back was that of Francis of Assisi. He tried to, make it, to bring about a moral reform. But even before his death, his order that he had established was already beginning to go back the ways 
the corrupt ways of the Roman Catholic Church, much to his uh, heartbreak over it. He was unable to morally reform the church. But after his death, what happened was there were a, bunch, a group of people who just latched onto his ideal and said, no, you know what? The papacy is corrupt. What the church has become is not right. And so we're going to take uh, the ideals that Francis was preaching from the Gospels, and we're just going to go live that out. They were called the Fraticelli. They were primarily in Italy, scattered in a few other places in Europe. Um, and they established their own congregations, in some cases their own hierarchy, rival to the Roman Catholic Church, existed entirely separately. Was it all under the... So was, was everything united under that one leader who could solve everything and give the one right interpretation? No. There were the Waldensians, a monk named Peter Waldo, that led a group to separate from the Roman Catholic Communion and taught many doctrines that would later be taught in the Protestant Reformation, condemned many of the same falsehoods. And later, the Waldensians uh, continued to exist and joined the Protestant Reformation when it happened. Uh, joined in. They existed in France, portions of Italy. Um, you had, by the 13th century, John Wycliffe, whose name is often attached to the Reformation, but he lived uh, over 100 years before um, the 95 Theses were nailed to the door. He started a movement in, in, uh, in England known as the Lollards. And they were teaching many of the same doctrines as the Protestant Reformation before there was a Protestant Reformation. Bohemia and the modern Czech Republic had separated from the Roman Communion under the leadership of one of John Wycliffe's students uh, J uh, John Huss, who was burned at the stake and whose writings would later be influential on Luther after the Reformation started. John Huss didn't influence the beginning of the Reformation, but after it started, Luther discovered his writings and realized, yeah, I actually agree with a lot of this, and it influenced him. And then he discovered Wycliffe's writings through that, and it fueled the Reformation. And so, for hundreds, all throughout the Middle Ages, we can point, these are just a few examples, group after group. Some of these groups we would have many agreements with, some we wouldn't. The point isn't that all of these groups were proto-Protestants. They weren't. Some were. The point is that prior to the Protestant Reformation, Europe was already divided into numerous denominations. Not to mention the, the sharp divisions within the Roman Catholic Communion itself. The Reformation, the only thing that it shattered were the false teachings. There was no great unity. That's, a, that's a, a myth of popular history that doesn't fit the actual facts. So understanding this, let's get into, very briefly, the dawn of the actual Reformation. So this is the world into which the Reformation came. And so in this world, a man named Martin Luther, he was raised and educated to be a lawyer, as many fathers would aspire to see their son grow up to be. Um, but one day while traveling, he was caught in a lightning storm, fearing for his life. He cried out to St. Anne to deliver him and swore that if he survived the storm, he would become a monk. Well, he did survive the storm, and he took his vow very seriously, sacred vow. He was, he was, he, and so much to his father's anger, who was looking forward to having a lawyer son, not a monk, Martin Luther did become a monk, become a very zealous monk. And here's the part of the story that I relate to Luther. I wish I could say I relate to all the good parts of Luther's story, but Luther's pre-conversion Luther, that's a guy that I relate with. Before I came to Christ, I was an agnostic. Even before I knew the word agnostic, I just believed that if there was a God out there, I couldn't know it. And I've never understood people who, who say, oh yeah, I'm agnostic, and they're like comfortable with that. That terrified me. Because if I can't know, then whatever God might be out there 
I have no idea which one or what standard to live up to. And so my solution wasn't just, oh, forget about it. I lived in perpetual fear and bitterness trying to live up to the standards of any possible God that I might face when I died. And I lived in hatred, hatred toward the God that I thought I didn't believe in. I hated his holiness. I loathed the fact that as hard as I tried to be good, the harder I tried to live up to any possible standard of morality, the more it exposed how dark my heart was and how incapable I was of living up to it. The harder I tried to live up to any possible moral standard, the more I collapsed under the weight of it. And I wasn't mad at myself for my failures. I was angry at God for being so holy. Knowing that when I died and stood before him, I would have nothing, nothing to say in my defense. That's the position Luther was in. As a monk, he tried and tried to live up to every possible standard that the medieval church had to offer. Every path he could go, he tried to live up, but all it did was continue to expose how sinful his heart really was. And it brought him to the point of despair. But in all his zealous labor as a monk, trying to be the best monk he could, he got himself appointed to a teaching position as a professor in Wittenberg. And as he was doing that, he ended up studying the Bible, the Bible itself, reading it directly, learning the original languages, realizing places where the Latin that most, uh, that most Bibles in Western Europe were in obscured some of the clarity of the meaning, really digging into what the Bible really said. And when he was reading in Romans, I'd love to read you, we're short on time, I'd love to read you the actual passage of what he says about his own, own conversion. We'll save that maybe for uh, Reformation Day sermon later this month. But... Uh, uh, but... Uh, he was reading through Romans. You should all go home after this and pull up a, few month, a couple months ago where um, Bradley did, uh, uh, did a summary of the entire book of Romans in, in one 45-minute session, and that'll give you a good take on what suddenly uh, um, Luther was hit with when he suddenly realized what justification by grace alone through faith alone that all of these works, all of these efforts were just as fruitless and futile as he felt and knew them to be. His heart was just as dark and sinful as he knew it was. God was every bit as holy as he feared God was. And yet, Christ bridged the gap, took sin upon himself, clothed the believing sinner in his perfect righteousness so that we could stand clean before God, not by our righteousness that we could never attain, but by Christ's. And realizing this, Luther began to teach that. At first, Luther doesn't even seem to realize that what he's doing is as countercultural. He's made this discovery for himself in the scriptures, and he's excited about it, but he doesn't seem to realize that the whole system is against him in this. But he does begin to teach it, and as he's teaching it, that recognition brings out some secondary issues. This idea of purgatory and all of these various uh, mechanisms that the papacy and the, the established church puts forward, and especially charging people money for them, where you can go and buy an indulgence to get a relative out of purgatory or reduce their sentence there. Luther looks at that and he compares it to the gospel he found in Romans. And he sees that these two do not go together. And so, Luther stands, he, he begins to try to teach against these various practices of trying to get time out off of purgatory through venerating relics and images, buying indulgences and these sorts of things. And he presents the 95 theses and, a lot of, and he nails it to the door, which is just a way of telling the other 
priests and academics in the area that he wanted to debate these issues. He wanted to get the other church leaders together and he wanted to debate these issues and discuss this. It wasn't an act of great defiance. Or at least it wasn't meant to be. But something had happened since all of these other reform movements, even the doctrinally more sound ones, like those of Wycliffe and Hus. And that's the invention of the printing press. And someone, we don't know who, not Luther, and they didn't ask him. There were no copyright laws back then. Someone got the bright idea of taking those 95 theses and making a bunch of copies and translating them from Latin into German so that everyone could read them and passing them out everywhere. And now all of a sudden, the whole region is abuzz with these teachings, with this idea. And completely out of Luther's intention and control, the Protestant Reformation is underway. The gospel is going forth. In God's providence, the timing was right for God to do a work that not Luther or any other man intended to happen, but it happened. Meanwhile, in Switzerland, in the, city, in the, in the canton of Zurich, there was a man named Ulrich Zwingli. He came at this from a very different approach. He was not plagued by the deep uh, conviction of conscience that Luther was. That wasn't his path to all of this. He was what was then called a humanist, which is not what we would today call a humanist. This would be, a humanist would be something more like a, uh, someone who studies the humanities, the liter literature and the arts, the classics. So he was a humanist. And Zwingli was studying this classical literature, but he also began to study the, the Bible in its original languages, to go back to the source. And this is what the humanists were doing in this age. They were saying, let's get back to the source on all these various things in all these areas of life. Get back to the earliest, get back to the source. And so he went back and started studying the New Testament as an academic exercise. But in doing so, he made very similar discoveries. And so he began to lead a reform movement. And his was more systematic. He did want to see changes. And so he gathered students together, first to teach them the classics, like Plato and Homer, the sort of Greco-Roman classics. And then, hey, you guys have learned Greek and we're studying the classics. Hey, how about Paul? Let's study him now. And now all these students around him, these academically trained students with sharp minds, begin to get excited began to come under conviction, began to be converted by the gospel. Not only that, Zwingli begins, to hear, begins hearing about this Luther guy, reading his writings. He doesn't agree with him on everything, but, a lot of the, but on the essentials he does. And that begins to fuel the movement even more. And so Zwingli starts challenging priests to debate, holding big public events, and trying to persuade the local government and the local people to begin a, a series of reforms. Well, Luther gets excommunicated. Zwingli gets excommunicated. But it doesn't stop. The message continues to spread. A scholar in England, fluent in eight language, languages, Oxford graduate, he comes under the influence of Luther. Luther gets excited about this, begins to teach these doctrines, and he begins to push that we need a translation of the Bible in English. Well, comes under legal fire for that. To avoid arrest and execution, he flees to Luther's Germany, and there William Tyndale begins producing the first English Bible from the original languages, learns not only Greek but Hebrew. Begins, he, he died before finishing his work. But his New Testament, it's only about this big. He intentionally made them very small so they could be smuggled back into England. Not big pulpit Bibles, little Bibles to hide with you. Read at home. Get out to the people. Begins to print these Bibles. Reformation spreads. Finally, and there's so many more men I could mention. 
And I understand men like Tyndale, Luther and Zwingli had the privilege, though they faced persecution in various points in their life, of living out their days or dying in means other than execution by their enemies. But Tyndale was not so lucky. He was strangled and burned. But many exact phrases from his translation are now it made their way on in to the King James Version and to, to our common vernacular today. God used his work and continued it. But within the next generation of reformers, one last name I'll mention will be that of John Calvin, the systematic theologian, the one who took these various reformed writings and teachings and ideas and put them together into a systematic document known as the Institutes of the Christian Religion, which influenced every single stream of Protestantism, even those that ended up not liking Calvin very much, were nevertheless influenced by the systematic theology that he wrote. Calvin began as a Roman Catholic priest in France. We know very little about his biography simply because he never wrote about himself, and none of his friends ever wrote about him. So we have to piece together little fragments we can get from documents. There's no biographical sources that we have to go on. But somehow, while in France, he come under, came under the conviction of Protestant teaching, came to believe in that, in that gospel, fled with the other refugees when persecution broke out against the Protestants in France, fled to Switzerland, where he was content to simply pastor a small congregation of French refugees until the institutes became far more wildly popular than he could have imagined and he could not maintain anonymity any longer. And so he was called to become the leader of the Reformation movement in Geneva, which ended up becoming the center of Protestant scholarship and missions for generations to come or at least a center of those things. And so these men, God used them to bring Western Europe back to the Scriptures, to the biblical gospel, to bring about a reform, to bring wayward churches back to His truth. Uh, some people ask, some people can often, especially in our context, mistake the Reformation for a restoration, that our idea is that the gospel was somehow completely lost and without the reformers, no one could be saved. Nothing could be further than the truth. Um, I, I, I stole this from Doug Wilson. I don't know if he stole it from someone else first. But when asked, where was the church before the Reformation? his response was something to the effect of, um, well, where were your hands before you washed them? They, they were still there. They just had dirt on them. There were things that needed to be washed off. That's what the Reformation was. It was getting rid of these layers of human tradition and error that had developed over the centuries that needed to be cast off. But Christ's people were still there in the midst of it. There were genuine believers in every generation. Up to that point, the reformers believed that. They didn't believe that they were starting Christianity over. They were reforming it. They were getting it back on track where it had gotten off track. And what was that track? Well, it's often summed up in the five solas. So what, are, what do we start by saying the Reformation was trying to do? Trying to bring people back to what is the gospel and by what authority do we know that gospel? So, sola scriptura, scripture alone, that the sole infallible rule of faith, the only thing today for the church that is breathed out by God, that is infallible, that we can turn to as without error, is the scriptures. It's the Bible. That we turn there as our ultimate final authority, and all other authorities are subject to that ultimate final authority. The sole infallible rule of faith is the Scripture, and that's the final court of appeal. 
on all things related to faith and practice. So, so beyond that, we have Scripture alone. So now, that's by what authority? So what is the gospel? That justification, salvation, our redemption, our being declared righteous before God, and being able to have eternal life with Him forever is by grace alone. It is His free gift and mercy to us, not something we in any way earn or merit. Through faith alone, there's nothing else we do to get that grace besides trusting in the finished work. Finished work of who? Christ alone. That Jesus Christ He, in his perfect life, fulfilled the law. And we can be clothed in that righteousness. We can receive that righteousness from him. And he receives our guilt and took our punishment on the cross. And all of this is to the glory of God alone. And just in brief, as a conclusion to that, to note the Roman Catholic response to this gospel was laid out in the Council of Trent, known as the Counter-Reformation, in which they said in Canon 9, if anyone saith that by faith alone the impious are justified, in such wise to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the obtaining the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way uh, necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema. And in that canon, they rejected the gospel, placed the anathema of condemnation upon anyone who would teach that by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast." They put the anathema on anyone who would teach, as Peter says, of him, of Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness. They put the anathema on Jesus Christ himself, who says, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. By the way, for anyone interested, the verses I just quoted are Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Acts 10, 43, and John 6, 40. And those are just a few examples of where this gospel that the Protestant Reformation came to turn people back to on the authority of Scripture alone is found. And so that is why we celebrate the Protestant Reformation. Because we in our churches today are heirs of that men, fa- those men, fallible men, men who got a lot of things wrong, who did a lot of things we wish they didn't do, and whom we should look on with the same grace that we hope future generations will be able to look on us but men whom God used in his sovereignty to his glory, not to reveal something new, but to turn us back to something unchanging, something he had established forever through Jesus Christ, written down by the apostles and prophets of old, inspired by the Holy Spirit, preserved for us forever in Scripture alone.